Hey, hey, fellow biophysicist. Welcome to another episode of the Theoretical Biophysicist Podcast. So today I'm happy to be with three researchers out of Brazil, uh, Hector, Marco, and Mendeli. Uh, thank you guys for being on the show and welcome. Thanks. 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 Thank you very much for this opportunity. Great, great. So um, yeah, let's just uh, go ahead and dive right in then. So the paper you guys were studying was looking at, you know, altruistic punishment. So, and kind of, if you have these colonies of stuff, how can we kind of operate between cooperators and defectors? So can you kind of give us, you know, a high level overview of what's, you know, kind of the gist of the paper? Okay, well, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll say a little bit about it. Uh, it has already been studied in the literature, some, some things which are similar to this, but I think the, the, the point that we focus here is in a really, really simple model, which uh, I think it was Ator and Lucas, the other co-author, who originally came up with the model. So I think he, they can say a little bit about it. Yeah, I mean, simple models are always nice to do, right? Because you get a very good intuition about what's going on. You don't have to worry too much about all these different degrees of freedom moving around. I think that this is the, the very interesting part of this paper, or the approach that we have used. Uh, it's a very simple approach for an interesting problem. So we start with a more complex approach to a related system, and then we start to strip it out everything that we don't need it. At the end, we, 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 I think that we reach the minimum that we need to have uh, our altruistic punishment as an effective way. And then we found this interesting emergence of symbiotic behavior. So yeah, I guess kind of the, the big question is, is what exactly were you hoping to kind of study with this? Nice. Um, if I may try to summarize, especially for the listeners who are not familiarized, we try to apply game theory models and maybe a lot of people watch that wonderful movie, A Beautiful Mind with John Nash and everything. Yeah, that's a great and, movie. I mean, it's game theory, it's economics, it's things that people from Wall Street talk about, but it's not only that. It's way, way more than that. And especially in evolutionary game theory, we have a lot of models that we apply to biological systems. And we can explain how, co we can try to explain how cooperation arrives in any competitive scenario. We know that individuals fight each other resource. <coughs> Selection would theoretically occur in the level of the individual. So if you can have more resources, why would any species as a whole have a cooperative traits? And then we have this amazing mathematical framework of evolutionary game that enables us to model quantitatively these behaviors and how populations could evolve to become more or less cooperative and so on. This is something like from the 80s, the 70s, that physicists started to dig deep into this. And we had a lot of models that are very nice to model how cooperation can emerge in a competitive system. Yeah, so but I guess... Now, yeah. I, mean, I guess it sounds like basically you really kind of want to be able to pinpoint when is cooperation beneficial, you know, because, you know, kind of on a greedy perspective, each person should act to their own best interests, right? Exactly, exactly. And if you go straight mathematically using every tool that Nash gave us in classical game theory, you have one single answer everybody should betray everybody. It, it, this was like a huge math, math, mathematical result. Is but that the, we is that the famous, and, yeah, that's the famous prisoner dilemma, prisoner exactly. dilemma, right? You know, exactly. whether or not to turn your fellow compadre in. Exactly. And if would, you do the math, 
you should always betray your fellow. And that's not <laughs> what we see in nature. We always see mutualism and symbiosis and a lot of very co cooperative systems. And this was a huge question. And then in the 80s, people started to find some answers on why would nature start to cooperate? Please, like Mendelis, you were going to... Uh, very small addition to what Marco said. Uh, the, the initial idea of game theory was its application to economics. And the idea usually that, that people have is that uh, we're, lead, we're dealing with uh, rational beings and they will always make the most rational choice. And That's a bold assumption, no, right? <laughs> that's not true. It's a very bold assumption. <laughs> and the transition to the evolutionary game theory studies uh, it's in a way it's it's uh, evolution is a better a system better described by these kinds of uh, equations and systems because you have a more precise ruler which is the fitness of an individual. So in a way you can say with uh, less care that yeah you, uh, if you're <coughs> fit you're probably going to be able to leave more descendants. So the whole idea of using game theory to study these evolutionary systems is that okay evolution has a, a clearer measure of what is to be fit and what is to leave descendants and what is to uh, uh, allow your strategy to live on so very good and all this with with these very simple models so uh as he said, in the literature, there are many, many different kinds of models, and there are many ways in which you can maintain cooperation. And we make this small addition with a simple model in which we found a rather, uh, how do you say it? I, I just lost the word. <laughs> the, <laughs> quite, I mean, it's, it, it was quite unexpected when we, we found the, the symbiosis, because at least to our knowledge, this is the first time that uh, symbiosis appears in a simple model like this. So yeah, I guess why don't we just talk or describe the model in a little more detail. So, you know, what exactly did you guys have? It seems like, you know, you have these different characters. We have cooperators, we have punishers, we have defectors. Why don't you guys try and describe in a, you know, kind of greater detail about what exactly is kind of the, the mechanism behind how you describe this game theory approach? Okay. Well, I, I can begin by what you said. The prison's dilemma is the archetypical model, and it's it's quite easily explained. If, for instance, someone has uh, has some money and he wants to buy something which is maybe not so legal, so the other person who who who's selling this uh, stuff, they agree to meet once and only once each one carrying a suitcase, uh, one with the money and one with the stuff, which is going to make be a part of the transaction. And they'll just exchange suitcases and they'll never see each other again. So- They'll uh, wash they, their they, hands and be on their way. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, they just- <laughs> yeah. Because uh, nobody's watching. And what one of them, oh, if I leave him uh, an empty, I, I can get whatever I want to buy and he, he won't have the money. But the other person, can have the exact same idea. And in the end, they'll just exchange empty suitcase. In that case, you want to bring a, an old dirty suitcase, right? So at least you get an upgrade in suitcase. Yeah. Uh, but mm. yeah, change no, it's <laughs> yeah. For another one. So it, it doesn't make any sense. So uh, in this simple scenario, we can see how the dilemma arises in the case of the prisoner's dilemma. And well, there, this is one of the models. And the, the model that we studied is very similar to this. But it's called the public good good public good game, and it considers an interaction between a number of players n, and then in this case uh, you can decide to either cooperate or defect. And to cooperate means that you're going to get some of your money and you're going to make an investment in a common pool. This all this money is going to be multiplied by a factor which is greater than one. And then it's equally divided between all of the players, irrespective of their strategies, whether they're cooperators or not. A defector will then just gain some money without having made an, an investment. So that is the, the simple uh, public goods game. 
And I think I'll, I'll let one of the other authors uh, comments on the, the, the rest. Okay, so I'll speak a little bit. Uh, so, uh, since the individual has this uh, advantage defecting the game, since uh, do not contribute, uh, if anything, and receive some money back, then with uh, a popular way to promote, or usually people try, a popular way is to, to introduce punishment. So there is a kind of another strategy where you can punish one of your uh, the other members of the group. So we start to work around with this idea in how I told you before in a more complex scenario. And then we say that it was too complex to start. And then we say, okay, let's do the, the simplest thing that we can think about it is that we have this public goods game, the PGG. And then we introduce the, uh, the punishment the Punisher strategy. So the Punisher has this strategy that he will altruistic punish. So he will punish in, uh, every uh, defector that he is his uh, in his group. So uh, yeah, he, how do you define these groups then? Oh, we start the the simplest way. You will have a, a player, and then you have uh, a group is formed by five strategies a group of five so you guys are doing this on some type of lattice right and you're just counting the nearest yeah. neighbors it's not a this, this is the general idea this is the general idea of the the public goods game involved but uh, at our simulations are on a let's see square let's see then you have a focal player and four nearest neighbors so okay so it's, your four I, nearest neighbors it's like you're going in on an investment you all put in money in but if you're in a if you're a defector, you basically keep everything to yourself. And then at the end, you basically divide everybody's investment by some kind of rate of return. And the goal of the Punisher is, is to find his, these defectors and basically subtract money away from them. Right? Mm, more or less, yeah. because yeah, you just... have to find the defectors. This one thing that we hope to do is that allow the defectors to move. But for now, they are fixed. Is just a, a evolving strategy. Okay, so I guess yeah, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but you know, how do you kind of per pick your parameter set that you want to search over? You know, because you kind of have this rate of return. You also have, you know, how much do I punish defectors, stuff like that. It's so it's very interesting. Yeah, please. Well, I'll let you say uh, say something afterwards, but the idea is that we have. Uh, we can have many parameters, but as always, we're trying to simplify it uh, the, the, the most possible without uh, making a trivial model. So basically there are, in the end, we are left over with only two parameters. One is the, the, the investment factor. So it's a number greater than one that uh, you get everything that was invested and multiply it by, by this number, which you call R. And the other one is the fine, which we make equal to, to what the, the punisher has to pay is the same as the defector, as the fine that the defector will receive. We, we came to this conclusion that it wouldn't make a, a great, we, we played around with the, the parameters to see if there would be any change. And we, we saw that having only these two parameters uh, being allowed to vary would be enough to get non-trivial behavior. I'll let Marco uh, complete what he wanted to say. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we are all theoretical physicists here, so we were not dealing with parameters that were obtained by experiments, you know? Like, mm -hmm. the main, main quantity is the payoff. And what is a payoff? I mean, if you have payoff of one. Is it one dollar? Is it one pound? What is it? And we here, here specifically, we don't care about that. I mean, later on, you can try to model, not model, like do real experiments and obtain real concrete values for what you mean by payoff. That is also called sometimes utility function. It's like the amount of happiness you gain from that interaction. It's loosely defined intentionally because you want just to model 
how you perceive some dilemma or anything like that. And then you plug it into like the fitness of the population. So but you guys basically have kind not, of a normalized variable set exactly. then? Exactly. So. We just normalize and that all comes from those very handy theorems that we have on game theory because actually if I have one dollar one dollar for an interaction, it doesn't mean if I gain 11 and you and then I lost 10 or if I gained 21 and then lost 20. You know, it's like a normalization and we can do that with the equations of the payoff. But we follow some rules like uh, it's what we call the hierarchy of payoffs, because if you put some reward for cooperating at a very high value, then everybody just cooperates and you don't have an actual dilemma, you know? So you normalize the parameters, but you have a range, like from zero to two in normalized units, you have a true dilemma. It's better for you to betray everyone, but once everybody starts betraying each other, the system just collapses in full betrayal. Yeah, so I guess you, know? you want to describe then, you know, what's if I see somebody's betraying a lot and I go, you know, that looks good over there. I think I'll, I'll take what he's having. So how do you kind of update this scheme to decide whether or not you're going to be a punisher, a cooperator, or a defector? That's the core of the dynamics. Exactly. You describe it perfectly. We try to model with uh, differential equations when we can analytically, and then with simulations. We compare the payoffs. I play with you, with Mendeley, with Fator, and then we look at everybody's payoff it will be similar to the fitness, you know? Then after we play it, I choose randomly someone and compare. If his payoff is bigger than mine, I will copy his strategy. This is an oversimplification because as Mendeley said, we are not fully rational. So the equations, actually we use something very similar to Fermi distribution because we can, um, introduce some noise, background noise in the decisions. Yeah, so it's this what we call irrationality. Noise, this background noise term that you have, it seems like it's more or less kind of an effective temperature, right? Perfect. It is, it is, it is exactly if you put the in the formula, it is exactly the effective temperature from the Fermi dis distribution. It is the same equation and everything. And then we model, you just copy another person's strategy with a given probability that is weighted by the difference between the payoffs of both of you. If we go too deep into this, it's actually a Monte Carlo very, very similar to an easing dynamics or any other Monte Carlo. But yeah, so I guess just kind concepts. of describing it in general, you can start with any configuration that you want and you're updating this thing through some type of Monte Carlo scheme. And it's possible to even start out with, say, like one defector in the group, but everybody, it eventually propagates through the entire system. And at the yeah. end, everybody's just defecting. Yeah. And even though we, we choose, uh, like, like Marco said, we choose the Fermi function, basically what we need is a distribution function of the payoff difference, which has to be a sigmoid or something like that. It has to start if the, if you, my payoff is really, really larger than yours, I have a really low probability of copying your strategy. So it begins at zero. And then it has to transition to one if my payoff is really, really larger than yours. I'm, if, I mean, if your payoff is really, really larger than me, I'm going to follow what you're doing with no doubt about it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, to... you see Jeff Bezos making a lot of money and you go, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah I think I I'm should gonna do follow, what he does. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to follow soon. Yeah. So, uh, what, but what we need to make these models interesting is that uh, when the payoff difference is uh, low, you're going to have a bias to try to go towards higher payoffs, but there's always some noise or irrationality that will prevent. So the, the details of this transition aren't really important, but we use this kind of Fermi function because it makes the system really 
close to some of physical systems. So in the literature, it's really common to use this kind of transition, but you could try others, for instance. Yeah, so I, like the does, it, uh, does it follow detailed balance, right? I think the Fermi uh, function does. Yeah, in this case, it, it probably does too. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess why don't we kind of jump then into kind of the results. You mentioned a little bit that you got kind of some non-trivial behavior out of this. So why don't you try and describe for us you know, what, what exactly you observed with this? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, we'll, we observed the following. So, uh, if you are uh, R, uh, R parameter, that is the, the amount that you multiply the common pool is very low, all the players try to defeat, to defect, is the, the usual way. So, the, this, so we have this parameter that controls uh, how many uh, how many punishment a defector receives. So we just check how many punishments neighbors this site in our square let's say has. And then this is the amount. There is a, a parameter for the punishment and a parameter for the, the multiply the common pool. So if we have the special case when the parameter of punishment is zero, we have the public goods gain. If this just one group, not the five groups, and uh, one group of five elements. And then we can note that we have a, a phase transition from a defector state to a, a situation where we have uh, islands of cooperators that have the uh, special special reciprocity from uh, May and Novak uh, paper from H2, similar. And then what we do now is to, if so, if we have two, two, two low um, multiply factor, we have factors. If we have too high, we have only cooperators. When you start to increase the punishment parameters, uh, it happens that in the, at the beginning, well, we see we start the system if one third or one third of each strategy, and then at the beginning, as the usual, if you check any simulation or very well known papers and reviews, the defectors hunt all the free cooperators because they have to group to have special uh, reciprocity, and so the the cooperators, the fraction of cooperators, uh, gets really low. And what happened, it happens this, the, essentially now after a while start to form these groups of the factors and of the punishment of the punishers. So these groups now have the very interesting property that this one, since our model is much simpler than the others, it's a little bit difficult to compare with previous results. But the idea is that now you, you have an island of cooperators and, and punishers and the, the factors are not cannot invade this cluster. And, and since now a couple, a couple of uh, two neighboring uh, punishers can punish the same defector on the border, this situation is quite stable for multiplicative factors of the public goods game much lower than before. So, so I guess with, to make it uh, kind of very clear then, if we have a punisher and we have a defector in the same group, when I'm getting back the money at the end of it, the punishers are basically saying they're taking money away from the defector, but they're also taking money away from themselves as well, right? Yeah, they contribute to the yeah. So it's, a, it's, an equal, it's an equal loss on both of their parts. Yeah. It's the and term okay. altruistic punishment. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly. okay if the fine is low. So the the punishers are able to uh, to withstand paying a small fine when it's uh, taken away from the defector also. So they they can survive. So that part is not the unexpected part. What what's unexpected is what happens for larger fines when you also have cooperators in the group. Yeah. Because so I guess one question though before that is. Where does this money go? You know, the the punishers are losing it and the defectors are losing nice it. Is there some overseeing government agency that takes this or <laughs> does it just disappear? That, that, that would be the common assumption when people first started to, to propose a punishment strategy. I mean, if the punish 
Punisher just steals the money from the defector and keeps it for himself, the result would be trivial. It would dominate the whole population because it's more than the defectors and the cooperators. But then we don't like trivial results. It's like, oh, let me propose a super cooperator. He gains more than everybody. That's boring. That's just mathematically boring. So we, not we, like most of the researchers that proposed the punishment strategy thought of like, it's costly to punish. You is that it's a governmental agency or something like that. Like, if the it's a robbery, they don't get the money that the robber would get. They they are a cost to the society. Yeah, they, I mean, it takes time, it takes things, effort, right? It takes, it takes effort to punish the wrongdoer. It's like a sinkhole of money in the, in the model. The punisher loses money, but he manages to make the defector lose money too. Cool, cool. So yeah, you. I guess we kind of danced around it a little bit, but you know, you mentioned kind of this like non-trivial symbiosis behavior where we kind of have these islands of different things forming. So no, no, it seems this, is, this isn't the first part when you have a not not very high punishment parameter. Then you have this island and. You need you don't need uh, uh, the multiplicative factor to be so high. This is the first part, but it, this is not so different. You, you essentially has a, a island or cluster in the middle of the sea of defectors. Uh, what happens? The most interesting part is when you start to increase a lot. Uh, well, in our arbitrary unit, the punishment factor. Um, uh, so. Okay, for very high uh, multiplicative factor, uh, factors, you always have co cooperation. So this is not the interesting part. The part is when you are below this operators and the factors system. So uh, it happens if, you, uh, at, at, uh, in principle, uh, the first part, uh, we observe that increasing the, the punishment parameter, the punishment uh, uh, defeat the, the factors. So there is just punishers in the system for a not very low multiplicative factor. Uh, when you st uh, keep going, increasing the punishment uh, parameter, what happens is that now one punisher that uh, encounters several defectors uh, spends so much money or energy to, to punish that he does not survive. So yeah, I guess if you have one punisher and kind of a couple defectors around, you know, you have to punish each one of them and you all yeah. you pay mm -hmm. the same penalty, whereas a defector only has the one punisher that kind of, yeah. uh, you know, it's so, if you have a classroom full of kids and there's only one teacher, it's easier to get away with some stuff because it's, you know, the teacher's <laughs> attention can be divided. Yeah, so we have this part that you can, uh, first part, you can share the cost of punisher, and then you have then the second part that the, the punishment costs are too high to survive. And then the unexpected behavior is that at some point, it starts the, symbi the symbiotic uh, behavior emerges. What happens? Then you have a population that starts with each strategy, and there is a specific special configuration where the, you have a couple like a, a clusters of punishers or cooperators don't make a difference but the inner part close to the border are are, are formed by punishers and the outside there is a thin layer of cooperators if you have this special configuration for high values of punishers the punishers inside the clusters when reach the surface, allow the other the uh, cooperators that are around to expand. And then these situations, um, these clusters grow indefinitely and they dominate the system. So, so you kind of have the... like these little micelles then of punishers surrounded by a little thin layer of cooperators? Yeah. Something in like general, that. of course, you have noise, so it's not perfect, yeah, not perfect. But, uh, in general you, if you look at a random group you have more cooperators around the the borders and the punishers within and what's interesting is that in these parameter regions 
neither punishers nor cooperators can survive alone. They only survive if they're in the presence of each other. So yeah, it's like the symbiosis, symbiosis, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's why we have symbiosis. Uh, the the punish the cooperator can only invade the defector if it is being punished at the same time. So that's the the unexpected thing that we found in this. Yeah, system. I mean this the kind of speaks... result. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean it is, like it is interesting. It kind of speaks to the role of, you know, kind of uh, the common folk, right? Like, you can't have all sheriffs and all bad guys. You need, like, some normal people in the system, I guess. But some I thought you guys did a... intermediary agent <laughs> there. Yeah, some middle ground there. Yeah. Exactly. I thought you guys did a particularly kind of, like, neat showing of this, where you basically have each of these... You created kind of these own little microcosms... You know, you had basically um, kind of this micelle, I guess, of cooperators and punishers. You had just cooperators, you had just punishers, and then you just kind of had a random mixing, and you let them kind of propagate through to see if this idea really played out. So I thought that was a, a neat showing that this kind of mechanism that you're proposing is actually um, on point. So one thing that I was kind of curious about this, though, is, you know, if you have kind of this, maybe kind of a, this surface-like effect, you know, you're defining these neighborhoods as only your direct neighbors. So if you were to extend kind of the region over which you have kind of this um, pooling of resources, how do you think this mechanism might change? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And it's one that we are currently analyzing now because, uh, <laughs> okay, you find this interesting behavior in a simple model and you can say, oh, okay, this is just peculiar to the square lattice maybe. So mm -hmm. the, the next steps are analyzing the, this behavior's robustness, which is what uh, uh, Lucas Flores, the other author, is has beginning is beginning his graduate studies. He's going to to start doing that. So we're looking into other geometries, for instance, the triangular, hexagonal, cubic lattices, just, and we already have some results that show that this uh, behavior is uh, qualitatively similar in every one of these lattices. And one of the questions is, is exactly the one that you're asking. If you make the, the, the interaction range bigger, well, what we expect is that if you, if you make uh, a system, which is the mean field uh, in which everybody uh, interacts with everybody else, then probably you only have the factors, which is the, the, what you get when you write down the mean field equations. Uh, while we know that cooperators and punishers, they need a small group to survive. So what we expect to see is that this, uh, there should be an optimum uh, size of this interaction uh, uh, neighborhood for the for altruists to, to do well in the population. So probably what would, we would see is that we would make a cooperation would do better as we make this structure a little bigger, but then if we make it too big, then cooperation will eventually die down. Interesting. Hmm. Um, so one other kind of question I guess I had is, you know, kind of this updating scheme. I'm wondering if you guys have thought about putting any type of, you know, memory effects into it. There's a, you know, a famous kind of quote, you know, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So, you know, instead of just updating the scheme that you get see initially, I'm kind of wondering if there's some way to put in longer term effects or how you think that would change that, this as well. That's a very nice question. And actually, we didn't put in sort of any memory effects, but it's because mathematically, the tools we need to use, there is a whole other area and it's a whole about memory air agent. Like if we have N players, 
we can have any strategies, it's okay. But as we increase the memory of each one, like if they remember the last turn or then two turns before this one, you just exponentially increases the computational capacity you need. And this, we have a um, twofold reason for not doing this, mainly because the actual exponentially longer and it's difficult, but most authors agree that we look for very, very simple cognitive processes, you know, like the evolutionary game theory is not just focused on how humans behave. Like it's one of the most beautiful results that we have. Like you look at bacteria and a lot of other very, very simple organisms. And when the environment is very acidic or with low food, they change completely their behavior and start to cooperate with one another. So you cannot expect very complex cognitive capabilities in these scenarios. So most of the research done is mainly focused on not using memory or at least just very short spans of memory. You know, yeah, but some type of exponential are... decay or something like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. There are some papers that use it, but we didn't focus it. Focus but when you, when you decide to use memory, if memory is to another strategy, a strategy how you keep your memory and you connect or disconnect to the interacting system, and this can be quite non-trivial, especially if you try to, to keep your system simple. So when we are reviewing the literature to the paper, we reach several papers that are interesting, but none of them you can see that they have a very well uh, posted symbiotic like effect and if out much more co uh, complex iterations and something like that. So yeah, I mean, the more complex that is really to make the simple, model, the harder it is to get something out of it, right? And generally. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, if, if you want to under understand the dynamics uh, or the what is behind the people, it's the way. This is one nice thing that we have in our paper. If you are, uh, if you are public, uh, start, like it, uh, you can check that we have a nice, uh, a nice picture is explaining the mechanism why the <laughs> why the uh, thin layers of cooperator helps the punishers and then both can uh, thrive against the defectors. So I guess we've kind of touched on this uh, some, but is there anything else that you guys found particularly surprising or particularly challenging? And also, you know, kind of what you kind of hope to look at next with this. I, I think there is one point that really amazed me, and it's very nice, especially given when you're in grad, grad, grad school or something and starting to do research, this thing that happened to us was very interesting. Like, there is the punishment strategy and there is a whole literature about it, a lot of papers and stuff like that. But we started our, our research just to trying to figure out how it would work, trying to see if we could look at another mechanism, put insert other strategies, and then we investigated all the range of the parameters. And eventually what we found out, the papers that we look at that in the literature just studied a very, very small range of this parameter of the punishment parameter. And when we analyze parameter range, then we discovered the symbiosis region, what we called in the paper, this whole symbiosis region. It was there, it was, it was not a new mechanism, it was not a new model, it was always there but nobody had looked at it carefully enough. And then we just 
stumble upon it. And a lot of times in research, you just do this, you know, you are researching the same model, but then you try to look, oh, this parameter doesn't make sh make sense if it is negative. Okay, but let's just see what happens if it is negative, if it is an imaginary number, I don't know, something like that. And then you discover a whole new world of effects, especially this, it, it was really lucky of us, like the symbiosis, you don't see it in a number. Like we needed to run the simulation with only cooperators and effectors and see that cooperators died. Then we run only with punishers and effectors and see that they, the punishers died, they got extinct. And then we run with all three strategies and then we see that the cooperation and punishment survived. That is the definition of a symbiosis, but it's difficult, you know, when you're doing research to figure out, oh, I was hoping that this hypothesis would give uh, the emergence of cooperation and it's dying. Oh, if I put punishers, it dies, it also dies. But let me try mix the two together. Oh, now they survive. So yeah, it speaks to the complexity, you. right? You know, I can't just have exactly. all these different parts and add them together. It's not a linear operator, so to speak. Perfect, perfect. The whole is more than the sum of the parts, exactly. <laughs> and it's, it happens all the time. It happens when you're doing research in grad school, in master's course, in PhD, after that. And it's nice to recognize these small details that sometimes it just goes unnoticed. So I guess there's three of you on the call now. So which one of you three is the cooperator? Which one of you is the punisher? And which one of you is the defector? <laughs> well, <laughs> all of us were really good cooperators. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so you guys are in all one regime right now. Uh, after the paper. No, it's, it's really the whole story behind the paper is quite interesting too, because Eitor was going on a leave for a sabbatical year and he had uh, Lucas who was his undergrad student. And uh, since I worked in the same area, we, he, he said, okay, could you look after him while I'm away? I'm going to meet him online, but maybe he'll need some help. So mm -hmm. I said, yeah, fine. So we studied, I started working together with, with Lucas uh, before the pandemics and Eitor continued working with him online and we already we knew Marco also who had been a post and worked with the same thing so we we asked him if he wanted to join us in this joint adventure with one in Spain the other here in and well everything went really well uh, all the four of us re met regularly every week and we exchanged ideas uh, gave new ideas and uh, I, I guess we were all cooperators. That's why we were able to, yeah, to get, get the something done. out of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and relating to the other question, uh, I think we could say a little bit about the politics and corruption. Yeah, because we can kind of use the a similar model to investigate corruption and punishment and bribery and stuff. And the, we, unfortunately live in a country in which we have lots of scandals happening almost all the time and one idea that we have is to try to uh, make a, a, a small model in which we say okay this will be a, a corrupt agent it's going to get some uh, money out of the common pool and something like that i don't know if marco wants to add anything about that no, you just said everything like there is so, it's a beautiful field full of things that you can apply mathematical equations to model. Then we just end up cooperating, <laughs> Three, the four of us, Lucas included, the first author, we just end up cooperating and uh, I don't know if I, there's anything else I could add. Yeah, that's great. So um, is there anything else you guys want to add? Um, if not, kind of my last question I always like to ask is, you know, 
where do you kind of see the future of biophysics going? That's an amazing question. That's an amazing question. Um, Save it for last. I don't know if I if I could talk a little bit like these are just my personal views. But as you said, like biophysics is like a priori an area that is just complex in the most mathematical sense. It's like nothing is linear. You just you understand A, you understand B, then you put A plus B together and it's a whole new thing, a whole new behavior. I really believe that we are starting to understand more in a quantitative way this complex process and learning to add together two complex processes and create the mathematical tools that we need to understand this. And for me personally, uh, machine learning and AI, specifically machine learning is, will be like a huge, huge tool that we can use to better understand these patterns, specifically to see patterns that we cannot see intuitively. And I believe it's like a huge science that will grow in major ways from now on, especially if you, if you include together with machine learning, you include like quantum computing, computers in the sense of like protein folding and stuff like that. Like you're really simulating a system using molecules that work as a simulation unit there like with molecular dynamics specifically, and then you just can do really things that you couldn't even imagine 10 years ago, maybe five years ago, you know? I, I believe it will be one of the fields that will benefit most from the growth of these two fields, like quantum computing and, and machine learning. But yeah, this is just myself, my personal opinion. Yeah, but, I, mean, um, I, I don't know then, if you've yeah. looked at all into the alpha fold, but they, you know, they just yes. won a big protein folding competition <laughs> using these machine it, learning techniques. Exactly. If you follow for a long time, you have like 10 years, one big discovery, then another 10 years, one big discovery, and then you have like a machine learning just sort some data for one year, and then you have like 10 papers, like with huge, huge things. Uh, th the next 10 years will be like that. It's just an exponential growth, in my opinion. And then you just discover new areas, you know, like, especially in our area of game theory, more focused on social dynamics. I believe that biophysics is starting to settle down in a more fundamental field. It's not, it will not be viewed as a derivative area from biology or physics. It will be its area on its own, very robust and everything. Yeah, and then it's, it's have not like the little brother that gets physics. kind of dragged along. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, you, now you have the tools. Archetypical models for this stuff. You have for cooperation, now you have this, all this area of active matter that since is always something that I research too. I think that's very interesting because then you, you give more space to the physics ideas in biology, in the sense that the mechanics plays a role. Because when you, when you read a, a biophysics or a biologic, uh, bi they have a lot of concern about the biochemistry process and gene editing and everything that you can do and vary and look to the results of uh, experiment. But they don't keep uh, so much attention to very basic things like the physicists uh, like to do like mechanics, thermodynamics or no equilibrium thermodynamics. And this is, I think that are, uh, several fields of uh, computation, math, physics that are go, uh, are um, putting together to study biology. And this will be something that's really cool because I think that also biology has accepted that you have basic physics uh, behind it. Okay, they know that you have basic physics behind everything, but uh, they accept as uh, 
don't know. Now I, it's I easier to put a, an exact expression to what you want to study. Yeah, I think that's it's very. Well, I think that's a that's a pretty good note to end on, right? A few, future optimism mm -hmm. for all the fellow biophysicists sure. out there. So yeah. with that, uh, Marco, Mendeli, and Hector, thanks so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.